Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success sisters. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. As entrepreneurs, we really get excited to start our businesses, to grow them, and to really invest a lot of our time towards these businesses. But if we spend so much time growing our businesses and doing all the essential things, we could find ourselves sacrificing family and friends in order to grow our businesses. So one of the ways to solve that problem is to design a business that runs itself. We're gonna talk about doing that. We have a really great guest who's going to go deep into that. So today's guest has grown three multi-million dollar ventures and sold two of them. He's a popular keynote speaker. He's constantly coming up with innovative strategies such as the profit first formula to grow healthy, strong companies. Um, He's written books like Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. But his latest book, Clockwork, teaches people how they can design a business that runs itself. Today's guest for episode 247 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Mike McCallowix. Mike, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mark, congratulations. Wow, man, that's so many episodes you've posted. That's amazing. Thank you, Mike. And I mean, you came on very early. We'll actually yeah. throw a link in the show notes because my interview style was very different. So um, it's really great to have you back on the show. I feel like a lot of people want to learn how they can uh, get their businesses to run by themselves. So we're going to talk about that. But can you just give us some basic background for why you decided to write the book Clockwork? Because I know you have so many other ones as well. Yeah, so I discovered recently, I've always heard of it, but didn't really appreciate what it was, this thing called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And what it is, for those who are not familiar with it, is uh, Maslow was a theorist and it studied human behavior and saw that our base need was uh, physiological needs, which means water, food, and so forth. And once we have that, then it moves up to the need for shelter, protection. Once we have that, then it moves up to the needing to belong to a community, and it keeps going up. We always revert to the lowest level. I mean, if we're starving for food, shelter, and hanging out with a group of friends doesn't matter. We got to eat. Well, I believe this hierarchy of needs translates into entrepreneurship, and I believe there's multiple levels. I, I think I've now discovered all the levels. But let me start with the foundation. The foundation is sales. Every business needs revenue generation. It's the oxygen for a business. Without it, a business will die. So you have to bring in revenue. The next level up then is profitability. That's why I consider the food uh, for a business, the nutrition. Uh, sadly, some businesses are selling as hard as they can, but they're really starving for nutrition. They need the food, they need the profit, yet they think the way out is selling more. So you know, they're starving that they're gasping for air to, sit, to fix that, which obviously won't work. But once a business achieves profitability, and that's what I wrote about in my book, Profit First, the next level up is, is running efficiently. So it's the capturing of time. Once an entrepreneur has adequate sales, is consistently profit, profitable, they want to balance their time. Maybe it's with life, maybe they want to explore other things, maybe they want to dig deeper into what they're passionate about within their business and not do everything. So it's just addressing time, and that's what Clockwork is about. I wrote the book so that the entrepreneur can design the business to run itself, that, that they can leave their business if they so desire, and the business continues to generate revenue for them and profit for them. And if they don't want to leave the business, but they want to do what they're most passionate about within the business and have other people or other things do everything else, that's what Clockwork does too. It allows the entrepreneur to have the business run itself so they can do what they want, when they want, in both their life and their business. And I really like the idea of having a business run on its own. I mean, there are some parts of my business that do run on its own. There are a lot of people helping me in the background, but um, some people, they may hear this, uh, they're wondering, like, 
how exactly do I know that I can start? Because some people, they think that um, I need to start now, maybe maybe too early. Other people, they may feel like they have to do everything on themselves and never start. So how would you determine the right time to start getting in the uh, clockwork mentality when you start thinking about how to make it run on its own? Yeah, it's a mental kind of transition. I, I think every business can start immediately. Even if you're a business of one, you can get the business to run on automatic. You have to have a realization. Uh, in the very early stages of the business as an entrepreneur, you are the only resource you're strapped for money. You need to do everything. And if your business doesn't have sales coming in um, today, right now, you're going to have to continue to do things because you're, you have no resource to, or no money to buy or pay for resources or people. As sales start to grow, you need to sustain and bring about profitability, you need it to run an automatic. So it starts, you start to playing clockwork as soon as you start having sales, which is most businesses. So if you're pre-revenue, don't do this. If you're post-revenue, if you have any degree of sales coming in, now it's time to start clockwork in your business. The process is we need to evaluate in your business what is the most important element that's determining your success. I call it the QBR or the Queen B role. And how it came about as I was doing research for Clockwork, I found that the most efficient organization in the world, effectively, is that it's not a human organization. It is a, uh, an animal or an insect. It's, it's bees. They're very efficient at scaling a beehive. They, they run very efficiently. And as I did research on them, I found they follow basically two simple rules. Every bee knows the most critical function of that hive is laying of eggs. There's big quote unquote, turnover in bees. They, they die after six to eight weeks. So uh, the queen bee who serves that role has to be laying eggs. And if she's not, the entire hive is in jeopardy. So what the bees will do is they make sure that the queen bee is producing, that she's fed, that she's protected, the temperature is right. Everything is situated so that the role of laying eggs and cultivating eggs can be served. Once they are assured, all the other bees are assured that is happening, then they go on and continue on with their primary function, which would be collecting pollen or nectar or defending the hive or controlling the temperature in the hive by flapping their wings. So I discovered this also translates into business. Every business has a critical function that the business success in life depends on. We need to identify it. And there's a really simple way of identifying it. Ask yourself, what are you known for? What's the most critical uh, differentiator of your, your business in the market? What's your brand promise? Uh, FedEx is a well-known brand. They promise that your shipments will be delivered overnight, uh, every single time. That's their brand promise. Therefore, if we peel back the onion one, just one layer, the QBR reveals itself. It's the function, the activity that supports that promise. Well, it's the movement, uh, the efficient movement of, of packages to get them there overnight or whatever they promise to deliver. If that function is failing, I don't care how friendly customer service is, how quickly they answer the phone, how clean their trucks are, well, their business will falter. Every employee needs to know that if that functioning, that function is not performing at the highest level, that attention needs to go to that. A good example for a small business though would be like a doctor's office. For many doctor's offices, not all of them, the, uh, the highest degree of care uh, is important, and how they express that, their brand promise is maybe the doctor's attentiveness, uh, you know, how much time the doctor spends with you. Other doctor's offices, it could be just their thorough exam, and maybe they don't spend much time with you, they kind of uh, just kind of blow up your patients. But let's say it's attentiveness, and spending time and listening to the patient. Well, that's what the doctor needs to do. If the doctor is, you know, down the hallway pulling files or processing insurance claims or any of that stuff, Every employee needs to know the business is faltering. That doctor needs to immediately go back to uh, the meet with patients, and the filing needs to be done by an administrative person, the checking in patients by an admin person, the insurance claims by an admin person. So in summary, what I've learned in Clockwork that every business uh, that is generating revenue needs to start becoming more efficient and start designing itself the entrepreneur needs to design it to run itself. And to do this, we need, need to identify what's the most critical role, that QBR, pay attention to it, meaning have every employee aware of what it is and protect it so that it's being served. And as this tide rises, so do all boats. So 
that's how you go about the clockwork process and, and everyone should start right now if you have sales. Mike, I really like the uh, queen bee role and that whole analogy with the bees, but I mean like bees, toilet paper, pumpkins, I kind of wonder what's going to come up next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I already started on the next book. I don't know what the analogy is yet, but it'll, there'll be something. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, we got to have you back on the show as soon as you come up with the next okay. analogy. But um, like the queen bee role, like I really do like that. And I mean, you mentioned like I feel like we have like this like main thing that we do it. Everything else rises as you mentioned before. But how can we uh, identify that queen bee role and get better at? Uh, yeah. Not getting distracted. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you. I give you one kind of general guide. So I'll give you something more specific in a second. So for, just again, the general guidance was this: identify what your brand promises. What is your business known for, or what do you intend it to be known for? What's the one thing? Once you identify the one thing you want to be known for, then we just peel the onion back one layer and say, what's the one activity that the business must deliver on that supports that one brand promise? That activity, that's the queen bee role. You know, the beehive is the one thing they're trying to do or being quote unquote known for is their survivability. It's a very basic function. The beehives are trying to survive. So rewind that to that back one layer. What's the one function that supports bee survival most and it's the laying of eggs. That's why it's the QBR. Here's another way. Once you identify what your brand promises, what you're going to be known for in the industry, I, I suggest starting off with six activities that the business does that supports what you're known for. So for me, for example, it's, um, it's what I want to be known for is delivering simple business, I'm sorry, complex business concepts in a very simple digestible form. That's what I want to be known for, that's my brand promise. So what are the activities I do that support it? Well, I write books, as you know. I, I do speaking engagements, I do interviews like this. Um, we do mailings to our email list. Uh, I do uh, public events where it's more of a mastermind. Right? So there's like six or seven things. So write those down. Each one of these items of these six things that you do that best support this brand promise, write on these separate sticky notes. There's six sticky notes, one with each item. Place these six sticky notes in front of you, and then we're going to play a simple game. If your business could no longer do three of these things, meaning three of these things are permanently pulled off, you're never, ever be able to do them again. You can only do three things to drive home that brand promise, what are the three things you would take away forever? They can't be delegated, no one else in your business can do it, they're just gone. With those three gone, look again at your business and say, okay, now I'm only pretend doing three things. Of these three things, uh, if I could only do two of them, which one would I take away? And you take away one more, now you're left with two sticky notes, and then the final function is, what if we had to take away one more and leave one, which one would we take away which one would we leave? That one that's left on the table, I call that the one for the wallet, because that's the one that needs to be stuck in your pocket. That one that's left over is what you've done through now deductive reasoning, or what you've determined to be the most important thing your business does. Now, the beautiful thing about the QBR is it's not uh, predestined. You're not told what it needs to be. Every business has the ability to select it, pick it. By doing this deductive reasoning, you now pick the one thing that you want your business to be known for, uh, or the one activity that, that's going to differentiate you and what your business will be known for, that's the one thing you need to focus on. You as the entrepreneur now need to devote your time to making sure it's done. Initially, in a small business, you may be the person that has to do that. The other work, all the other work you're doing, very selectively and very persistently over time, you need to delegate that stuff out to other people, focusing more and more on QBR. Then ultimately, to truly free yourself from business, the QBR needs to be served by other people. Just like at FedEx, the founder of FedEx is not delivering packages. Uh, they're, you know, that founder is managing strategic direction. Jeff Bezos from Amazon is not doing the shipments anymore. He did in the beginning. Uh, you know, Amazon, their brand promises absolute convenience. Everything they do that supports convenience is the QBR. But Jeff Bezos is not there uh, you know, shipping packages or even doing the code. He's removed himself. So if Jeff Bezos decides to go on vacation for three or four months, yeah, maybe some of the strategic and visionary work's not being done, but Amazon will continue to hum along. That's a business that can run itself. I believe you don't need to be Amazon side actually convinced of it. You can do it with a very small business 
once you understand this concept of the QBR. And I really like um, how you mentioned just identifying some of those few things that match up with your mission and picking only a few that you really focus on. And I mean, delegation is something really important. It's something that you really have to do at a certain point. But uh, what about the person who is uh, just trying to get to that revenue stage where they don't have the money to delegate? Would you recommend like spending less time in the other areas that aren't the QBR eliminating them completely? What would you recommend for that person? Yeah, that's exactly it. So if you have no funds or very little funds, it is really the resource, the use of the most critical resource we have, which is time. Trying to pack more in in a day and try to do more things is uh, is exhausting. And and as I study productivity, there's tons of productivity tools, often actually falls upon itself or, or collapses because as we become more productive, that means we can do more things. Therefore, we take on more things, which forces the necessity for more productivity. It forces the necessity for productivity, but it doesn't force selectivity. And that's what we need to do. We need to select the things that are bringing results versus the things that are not. And in most businesses, the vast majority of things that we as entrepreneurs do and the employees do are, are doing very little to move the business forward. It's a few things that we do that move the business forward in the most or the biggest way. So we need to identify those few things, which is QBR. So yes, reconcentrate your energy. Do more focus on the QBR. You know, some people are like, I gotta, you know, I gotta spend so much time marketing, you need to get the word out. But what if what if your search was so remarkable that it marketed itself? That people just lauded on about how amazing you were and they became your marketing force, your customers, because they loved you so much. Would that work? Well, absolutely. There's businesses that do that. So it's reputation, right? It's word of mouth marketing. So we need to select where we're going to concentrate our energy. The second thing is, you know, people get so afraid of the cost because they, they don't consider the options that are out there. We, you know, you, you may need someone to do your social media. That's what we needed here. And we're like, wow, social media manager, that's someone like that would easily charge 40000 a year. But, you know, someone that's really great at this, maybe sixty dollars or $100,000 a year, we could never afford this. We had to keep it in-house. And we stopped for a second and said, hold on, let's reevaluate this. What are the functions we think we need in social media? Well, someone who is just, you know, regular posting of pictures on Instagram and, and Twitter, do some stuff on Facebook. And when we broke it down, it was actually just, uh, my, most of it was a simple sequence of repeatable tasks that was the most important. Well, we got uh, someone at local high school that was interested in this. She was just looking for a, a job for after school. A minimum wage met her objectives because she had no work experience. But she did have social media experience, and we brought her on. We showed her exactly how we got this process done, and, and she has been a rock star for us and is very affordable for our needs, but we're also meeting her objectives of getting some corporate world or business experience so that when she enters college, she has a little leg up in, in the process. So I just want people to pay attention. We, we hesitate and pause to do things because we walk in with an assumption of great cost or burden or whatever. There's often alternatives out there where it can be, you can achieve the objective you want if you simply think a little bit outside the box. And uh, having interns is definitely a very outside of the box approach, something very interesting because, I mean, especially when you're at that revenue stage, you don't necessarily have the kind of money that you can just delegate and hire people. And the intern can really make a big difference. I'm wondering, how do you go about finding um, interns for um, your brand? Um, and like how that how like someone the personal brand can do the same. Yeah, so we uh, interns, part timers, we've had tremendous success. Uh, we have we're a small company. We've ten of us here, and I think seven people are either part time or intern. Here's how we do it. The, the first thing is on Facebook. You, know, I go to my Facebook page and have my a few hundred quote unquote friends on that page, and I'll simply say, hey, we're looking for someone. If you know someone. Um, would you please spread the word that we're looking? And we found many interns this way. A local parent says, oh my gosh, my kid's just looking for a job, I'm so happy I saw this. Or I was, you know, I, I had coffee with one of my friends down the street, my neighbor, and they said their kid was looking. So I like turned on to someone. So we found people that way. I think even more innovatively than that, we run really unique ads. You know, if, if you go to any of these job sites, you'll see a list of, hundreds of ads that are, are almost clones for each other. You know, looking for admin 
HR person or looking for social media expert, right, is the title. Then it says, you know, come work for a great company. Um, we need someone with at least two years degree of college education. The salary range you can get to X, um, you know, and you, whatever. It has these, these job requirements. They're so standard that it's hard to distinguish one company from another. So we run these really unique ads. We're like, you know, the title will be, are you awesome at social media? Then the question, then, then the uh, advertisement, it's a super long ad that talks about our culture. It's like, before you even consider this ad, we want you to know that you have to be good at shooting dark guns. The reason you have to be good at shooting dark guns is at the office, about once every couple of weeks, a dark gun fight will break out. And yes, you'll be equipped with the dark gun the day you arrive here. Um, it goes on to explain more. It talks about the, the salary. It says, um, you know, this is the good news, but let's, let's, let's tell you about the bad news. The pay here sucks. And that's the exact words we use. We pay $10 an hour. So if you're looking for a job um, to support your lifestyle, this is not the job. But if, if you don't have um, financial concerns and you're looking for an outlet to uh, have a great time at work, to, to love the environment you're at, and have some extra spending money, this may be a great fit. Then buried in the ad, usually toward the bottom, we'll say, if you're in fact reading this entire ad, we only want to talk to people that are truly interested. Please include certain verbiage in the reply to this via email. So we'll put like, you know, I love to shoot dark guns or something as the subject line. Now the hundreds of responses we get, the, you know, the 10% that actually read the entire ad have that subject line in it and we talk to those people. Everyone else is just kind of clicking and responding to everything. It's not who we want, so we skip them. And these really unique ads have served us extraordinarily well. We have, I would argue, some of the best talent uh, for what we need that we could ever gotten because of these unique ads. And I find it really interesting, like you say on that main point, we have the best talent for what we need instead of like all these different things that you may not necessarily need, but you have people in those roles anyway. And I wanted to ask about that because uh, one of the things that I feel like a lot of people think about is omnipresence, being active on all the social networks and like repurposing, uh, like it helps out with that, but you don't necessarily have to be active on all the social networks, be doing everything in the very beginning, just focus on uh, as Mike McCallum said, that queen bee role and really eliminating the distractions that stand in your way. But one of the things that I want to ask you is that there are a lot of people who they have businesses, but they're not necessarily on that clockwork level. They're not necessarily at the point where a business is run themselves. So what do you believe holds most people back from getting their businesses to that clockwork level? Yeah, so what holds them back is they think that it's a on-off switch. Most entrepreneurs, as I interviewed, I interviewed for the book about 75 different businesses that were running super efficiently to figure out what the common thread was. I include, I narrowed down to the 20 you know, really most impactful strategies to put them in the book, but also met with now over the years tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 plus entrepreneurs, and spoke with them at my conference and so forth, and you know, asked them, what's the work environment like for you, for you as the owner? And most people are like, I, I work you know, nine to five. And I was like, which nine to five? Wondering day or night, you're like, no, the one at night where you start working at nine o'clock at night, you work through the night till five o'clock in the morning, between five and nine, just putting out fires. You can't do any work because you're just scrambling to address a customer complaint or address an employee. But then at nine o'clock when things quiet down, that's when you turn the heat. It, it, it's this exhausting cycle. So I said, well, why don't you start why don't you have your business start running itself? Why, why are you beholden to it? And they say, I'm just not there yet. The day I get there, I'll flip the switch and I'm just going to manage the business. So what entrepreneurs see is they're, they're going to work their butts off until one particular day, and that day, no longer work their butt off. Now, miraculously, uh, they're just managing the business. It's a switch. It's what they see. But the reality is it's not a switch. It's a throttle. The clockwork process does not happen overnight. It's a continual rollout. Actually, I even have a suggested agenda in the book about an 18-month rollout to slowly, step-by-step, step, remove yourself from the business being dependent on. And what you do is you take small steps, but consistently small steps over time, the business is less and less dependent on you. And 18 months in, or maybe 24 months in, now the business no longer needs you. And you can run what I consider the ultimate test, called the four-week vacation. 
And so what we tell business owners to do is declare four weeks you're going to be away and disconnected from the business. But the business needs to continue to run. Prepare for that. The, the reason we pick four weeks, by the way, is that when if you remove yourself from the business for four weeks, almost all businesses experience every element that that business is going to uh, address during four weeks. You're going to maybe have a new client prospect, maybe you'll have a client who will leave. Uh, you'll have uh, employees that maybe you need to hire, uh, or maybe you have to address an employee that's struggling. You'll have payroll, you'll have uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, customer service requirements. All these different things will happen during a four-week four period. If you're going to be away during that, that means you have to be prepared or the business needs to be prepared to address it. So by declaring a four-week vacation, you start working immediately on making this a reality. Now, the thing is, when you go on a four-week vacation, it's a full disconnect. We're not going to – our first test, if our business can run on its own, is not going to be four weeks. What we do is build up to it. So as that day comes that we're going to leave for four weeks, as we're slowly approaching it, we first take a one-week vacation. Leave the business and disconnect for a week. Come back at the end of the week and see how the business did. There will be problems. Things will have gone awry. But what those problems were are the things you need to fix. So they're shored up and they work on automatic the next go around. Then you can do a one week vacation later on and test it again. Once that's successful, you go to the two week level. And then once that's successful, then we cut over to four weeks. But when a business can run its own for four weeks without you, it is positioned to run in perpetuity without you, which means your business is running its own. And I mean, I think a lot of people do think it's the on off switch. I've talked about delegating with other people and I feel like there is that theme where they think it is the on off switch and it is very important to do it gradually. I mean, I, I started off with hiring one part time assistant and um, like it wasn't a really big um, investment in terms of money, but it was something that got me into it. It's something that allowed me to see the potential and allowed me to get started with delegating some of the parts of my business. So I definitely recommend taking baby steps with this instead of thinking one day you're just gonna have a whole team uh, surrounding you. So I really like that advice. And as you mentioned, like there are gonna be certain problems that we face along the way. And I'm wondering if you share with us one of the big challenges you faced on your journey to, in a sense, clock working your business and uh, having it run on its own. Yeah, so, so my next four week vacation is coming up December, this upcoming December 7th to January 7th. I'm, I'm on a total disconnect. And the first test was I was away in Australia. So, you know, I'm here in the US and New York area. That's a big disconnect because I'm even on a different time schedule as away for uh, two weeks. Well, as, as I'm away, uh, I notice I'm not getting any emails. I mean, not overnight or, or definitely not real time because of the time difference. And at a certain point, I'm like, I wonder why no one's paying me. Well, the reason no one's paying me was the business was running on its own. They didn't need me. Uh, and then, then came the biggest barrier to the success of this, and was my ego. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh my god, no one needs me. I'm, I'm here in Australia by myself, and nothing to do, twiddling my thumbs. I got to reinsert myself in the business. So I started to ask irrelevant questions, put uh, nonsensical demands on my colleagues, and really just threw a monkey wrench in the system. And the business started becoming dependent on again on me. We started to fill up my ego, like, hey, the business does need me, which was all a subconscious thing. Reality was it wasn't, and I achieved my vision. I just didn't expect the blow to the ego. What I've come to realize is, is that when I remove myself from the business, I need to elevate to the next level. True strategy, true vision, really thinking uh, long term and near term and putting the business. In, in a position to have extraordinary success, strategic relationships, true strategic relationships uh, on, a, on a big level, all these things I could do, which I was avoiding because I didn't have the time. I was doing all the nitty gritty day to day stuff. But my ego really took a blow when I was no longer needed for the day to day. So once I had a realization and became conscious, I realized I still go through it. When the business doesn't need me, to a certain point where I kind of get whiny to myself, and it's embarrassing now. Um, and I realized when I'm getting whiny, that is really a call for me to get elevate my game again and be much more strategic, much more thought to my business. I now actually have a hero I look up to. There's a statue actually dedicated to this. There's a statue dedicated to the most important role we as owners can serve in our business. And that is design here, as it says, thinking about our business. And that statue is the thinker. There is a statue called the thinker. We need to spend a lot of time with our 
chin resting on our fist. We don't have to do it in the nude, by the way, but our chin resting on our fist. That's thinking about our future because that thought is where inspiration comes from, strategy comes from, the most important elements of moving your business come from. And I see that um, with myself also. I mean, I, it's really great to be action oriented and do a bunch of different things. But if you spend some time to think about what you're doing and some of the ways you can move forward, it allows you to come up with new ideas, allows you to view some problems and some opportunities in a different way that can really help you to move forward. So I really agree with that. And uh, one of the things I want to um, also ask you, I know you've written a bunch of books. Uh, we've covered pumpkins, toilet paper, bees, but um, I also am wondering what are three books that you believe will have a positive impact on us? Um, oh, there's so many. I'm constantly reading. Um, I almost want to pull my Audible right now. Uh, so let me just kind of off my head. Uh, Ray Dalio's new book, which is called Principles. Uh, he's a hedge fund manager who's widely successful very fascinating book, shares his own biography and his own life's principles. It, it's an extremely uh, long book, but I think if you read it, it'll be well worth the investment of time. Another book, which is a classic, but is not read much by modern business, uh, or I should say uh, online business is much more used in traditional business. There's a book called The Goal, G-O-A-L, uh, by a guy named Eli Goldratt. And he study this concept called theory of constraints or TOC and how the small kind of links in the chain that are the weakest in our business actually are having the biggest effect in our business. So when we can identify those weak links and address them, the entire business elevates on a, on a massive level. Um, and then I think, you know, if you really want to dig into clockwork, uh, my book on scaling, your business, I, I think there's a couple others that complement it. So uh, you have to be three, but maybe two more. Uh, Scale Up by Vern Harnish, I think is an extraordinary read. And then Gina Wickman's Traction. Read those two books, maybe complemented by Clockwork. I think you have a powerful formula to scale your business and have it run on automatic. Michael, thank you for sharing with the, uh, Mike, thank you for sharing with us those uh, great book recommendations. We will throw all of those into the show notes, markberry.com slash E247. We'll also throw in podcast domination um, in there as well, markberry.com slash PD for anyone who is interested in that book. And one of the things I want to do as we wrap up, um, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? Uh, I think instead of asking, how do I get things done? I think we need a new question and say, who will get this done? I think that's the, actually the challenge the entrepreneur has. We constantly ask how many can get this done, and we put more and more weight on our own shoulder. But if you ask, start asking who will get this done, it'll get you in that clockwork mindset of finding other people and other resources to get the tasks done and get your business to run on its own. Mike, I really love that question. And based on our whole conversation, it definitely has that clockwork theme where you think who is going to get this done, where it's not just you, it's other people helping you. So. Great question. Great insights throughout this episode. Uh, don't forget to check out Mike's book, Clockwork, Design Your Business to Run Itself. He's also got his website, MikeMcCallowicks.com, where you can learn even more about him. But uh, Mike, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all of your great insights with us. It was such a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Success. Oh, it was my joy. Thank you for having me. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn.